All right. Hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. And today I'm joined by Julie Holmes, who's in the UK. How are you doing, Julie? I'm doing great, John. How are you? Excellent. And today Julie's going to talk to us about the million dollar questions, using questions to connect direct and sell more effectively. So Julie is a motivational sales speaker and sales expert. So let's talk about what, what, are, what do you mean by million dollar questions? Well, when we talk about selling, the number one thing that salespeople can do is not sell, but to ask questions, to learn more about their prospects so that they know when the right time is to offer the solution. And questions are just like the best way ever to actually take that buyer on the journey that they want to be on and that they're engaged with. And that at the end of the day, when we offer up a product, we know we're offering them exactly the right thing that they need. So, I mean, a lot of salespeople would say, yeah, I, I, I ask questions when I'm talking to, to my uh, prospects. And so what, there's questions and there's questions, right? So what is yeah, the difference absolutely. between like million dollar questions and 10 cent questions? Well, that's, that's a great way to describe them. Those 10 cent questions. I love it when salespeople will say to me, oh, yeah, I ask questions all the time. But it's questions like, do you like this feature? Would you like to buy this now? You know, like mm -hmm. it's they're they're specific. They're very focused on the salesperson. They're not at all focused on the buyer. Mm -hmm. And so, what ends up happening is salespeople try to use questions as a sales tool rather than a learning or engaging tool. Mm -hmm. And consequently, buyers put up barriers and they throw up those walls. And they're like, "Look, I'm not falling for this." It's like that great question: What keeps you up at night? Right, right. Um... <laughs> Uh, the neighbor's neighbor's dog sometimes that's about it but <laughs> so how do you help salespeople? so when you start to engage with the prospect um first yeah. what are the kind of uh, questions that you should be asking to open a, a good uh, discovery dialogue well i think before we even get to questions it's actually about understanding the function of the questions themselves mm -hmm. so before you even go in and start asking questions it's things like having that strategic intent with your questions. So rather than just going in with, I've got a list of 50 questions and I'm just gonna work my way down the list, or I've got no questions at all, so I'm just gonna play it by ear, you know, a good salesperson is really thinking strategically about what's happening on that conversation, what they're trying to achieve from that conversation, and what information or answers or guidance or or goals do they have so that they can formulate questions that are relevant and will guide things in the right directions. It shouldn't just be a half ass mm -hmm. a half hazard or half ass for that matter, <laughs> a half -ass hazard way of, of getting information from a prospect. If you don't know what you want to get, it's going to be really hard for you to get it. So, so before you start, it's actually understanding what your strategic intent is. Yeah, so it sounds to me like then that a key part of this is obviously planning for the calls in the first place, right? Yes, how novel. Yeah, yeah, we should be question we should be planning because if nothing else, the last thing that we would want to do if we talk about things you shouldn't do with questions, it's to ask the obvious questions. It's right. to ask the questions that your research should have already informed you about. You know, I love the the salesperson who goes in and goes, "Yeah, so what's your role at the company?" Right. As if they couldn't possibly find that out in any other way. Yeah, I think there's nothing more um, frustrating nowadays with all the information available is that when somebody asks you questions, as you say, that they could easily have found out already. And uh, that shows a lack of respect for your time, um, if nothing else, right? Absolutely. And frankly, it is an immediate flag that that seller is, is I don't know, beneath you. You know, part of the goal of being in sales or part of the objective that we should have with questioning is building rapport mm -hmm. and creating a relationship with a buyer. And to do that, we have to be peers. Right. We have to be seeing ourselves on the same level. And when we come in and start asking dumb questions, for lack of a better word, when we come in and start asking dumb questions, we're basically saying, yeah, we, we really aren't on the same level as you. So it's okay if you don't respect, you know, don't respect us, don't respect our time, don't respect the value we can bring to you. So what are, what are some examples of some great uh, opening questions when you're early in a, in a cycle with a prospect? Well, I think some great questions that you can ask are about their business needs and about the pain that they're experiencing. So for example, um, I might ask you, um, let's say that we're talking about a CRM system, for mm -hmm. example, and I might ask you, you know, tell me about your biggest challenges with CRM. Right. 
you know, or your biggest frustrations. The word frustration is a great word to use in questions because it's really emotive. Mm -hmm. and the word frustration will go, I'll tell you what frustrates me. Right. <laughs> <laughs> when they sit up and they lean in, I'll tell you what frustrates me. And, you know, then you can also ask about things like, you know, well, tell me what you've done up to now. Right. What's been happening? We want to understand the history. Mm -hmm. And then you can say, well, in a perfect world, what does it look like? Now we start to understand about their goals. So really there are five types of questions or five goals um, mm -hmm. of questioning when we work in sales. The first one is of course, building rapport and setting up relationships. Right. You know, tell me about you, tell me about your business, tell me about how you like to work with salespeople. Mm -hmm. You know, I think there's a really, you know, when you can find the right opportunity, you can say, look, how do you, how do you want to communicate best with me? Yeah. Do you email? Call you? What do you want? I think that's a great one, actually. I just, uh, but just hone in on that for a moment because I think that's a great point about you know saying how do you want to work and how how do you feel comfortable. And I like the part where you actually just said, you know, how do you like to work with a salesperson? So not like you're pretending not to be a salesperson, which is something that drives me crazy when people say, you know, they come in with their business card almost saying. Honest, I'm not a salesperson, but I'm here to sell you something. <laughs> and you just go, yes, I, I know you're a salesperson. But if you take control of that situation, like you just said, and said, okay, how do you like to work with a salesperson? How do you like to communicate? I, I think that's a fantastic way of establishing rapport and respect, right? Absolutely. And I think it gives them a chance to feel like, okay, you're not trying to pull anything over on me. And, you know, buyers don't want to feel badgered. They don't want to feel pushed in a corner. The relationship is different these days. Mm -hmm. It's not really so much buyer and seller as it is a partnership where everybody's looking for mutual benefit. Right. And which is you the know, way it should be. Absolutely what we're after. Mm -hmm. um, so what would, sorry, that was, I interrupted you there. You were going on to the other um, four types of questions. Right. So our first one was building rapport and setting up the relationship. And our second one is really understanding our buyer's style. Mm. So those are questions that will help me determine what type of data, what type of um, style, what type of communication mm. does this buyer connect with best? Right. And we know there's all kinds of different kinds of buyers. There are data-driven buyers. There are story-driven buyers. Um, there are ego-driven buyers. And if we understand what their motivations and their triggers are, well, then we can ask questions and communicate with them in a way that really connects with their style. Yeah, and that's a, and again, that's another key point. Again, not to try and sell to everybody in the same way. And as you said, like different buyers have different styles. Just like we have all have different ways that we like to consume information. And I think sometimes we forget when we're in a in a in a seller buyer buyer seller um, situation, particularly as a seller, we sometimes tend to forget that we're buyers ourselves, we're receivers of information ourselves, and we have our own style and we have the way we look. So why wouldn't we try and understand the other person's? Well, or the fact that sometimes we will act as salespeople in a way that we would never want a salesperson to act. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So what's the, um, so that's the two, what's the third? The third one is to understand, to ask questions that help you to understand the buyer's um, priorities and values. Mm -hmm. What's most important to them? Are they looking, you know, because they want to save time? Are they looking because they want to save face? Are they, you know, looking for a solution because they want a legacy? Are they looking for a solution because they've been pressured into it by the board? Like what is their drivers and their motivations? And there's a whole bunch of questions that we can ask around that to help us to understand. Yeah. No, I, and again, I think that's another critical point because I think sometimes when you when you get into a questioning sequence, um, you know, they can a buyer can come up with some issues or whatever that they would like to solve. But if you dig down deep enough into them, you discover not really a priority. They're not really. There's something that yeah, they can live with. They can live with. So it's not really something that they have that great a motivation to solve. Whereas something else might be. But if you don't dig deep enough and understand what the priorities are, you could go chasing the wrong ones, right? Absolutely, and you could be giving them the wrong the wrong buying indicators. You could be pressing them at the wrong time. Mm -hmm. You could be missing an opportunity to press them. You know, if you know that they're trying to, if you find out that they're trying to leave a legacy, well, you're on a finite time scale at that point. Mm -hmm. And that also means that you need to start building relationships with the replacement, right? Who's going to come in and step into that role? 
So there's a lot of things about the, the values and the priorities that can inform what we say and how we interact with them. Mm-hmm. And so what's the fourth one? The fourth one is about understanding the landscape. Mm-hmm. So questions that we can ask around, well, who's all, who all is involved in this process? Um, who would you say are the, are the major um, influencers in this selection process that you're going through? Um, how long does a sale process usually take with you guys? Mm-hmm. What types of things that come up a lot during your sales process? What are the approval steps like? So understanding the landscape of the transaction is really helpful because again, then you'll start to know when should I ask for the sale? Is there a timeline? I know it has to go to the board for approval Mm -hmm. or it has to go to a committee meeting. As soon as I know that, I've now got a date on the calendar I've got to work to. Yeah. Uh, one of the one of the features that we built into Pipeline and CRM was actually exactly this because it's so critically important. Um, you know, we have the we have an org chart. We also have a buying center. And this is, I think, where a lot of salespeople sometimes don't do enough work around. And, you know, and exactly what you're describing, like the political landscape. OK, this person is the decision maker, but this person is an influencer. This person is maybe neutral this person may be an assayer over here may need to be neutralized or you need may need to equip this person to sell on your behalf to that person right because you're not getting access so i think those are critical pieces and um i think the buying process and the timelines and all of those are are fantastic questions and sometimes people leave it too late to ask about that (laughs) they do and then all of a sudden they're they're side railed and they have no idea how that happened like how did this (laughs) how did they you know, they were sitting there with a 90%, you know, <laughs> yeah, for this <laughs> month. <laughs> and all of a sudden, they're like, what? What do you mean? This is you're not taking you're taking me out of the equation. How did that happen? Yeah, or or you conversation to have with your sales manager. It is, especially if you have forecast that for this month, and you've suddenly discovered late in the process that it has to go to the board. And guess what, the board doesn't meet again till next quarter. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, that is a great, great example. And I think all salespeople have made that mistake at least once. Oh, for sure. And so what's number five? Number five is kind of my favorite. (laughs) Number five is questions that help you identify the fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Mm -hmm. Questions that help you find the blockers. So I often say that, you know, the, the salespeople, their primary function as salespeople is to actually overcome fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Mm-hmm. Because you can do everything else right in the sales cycle, but if you can't do that, you can't close. Yeah. Or even if you do manage to close, you've now closed on a shaky deal where they're going to be looking for that fail all along the way. So you haven't built a solid foundation for the ongoing relationship. Because I'm a, you know, my... Oh, my motivation, my inspiration is all about these ongoing sales yeah. and maintaining a, a long-term revenue stream and relationship with our prospects and our customers. So if I don't deal with that fear, uncertainty, and doubt, if I don't know what it is, I can't deal with it. Yeah. And I think that's something that's often underestimated. And I think uh, sellers sometimes you know, guilty of over looking how big a decision a b2b buying decision can be and how much impact it can have on the person who's making that decision um, because let's face it if you when you make a b2b buying decision in an organization you know by default you become associated with that yeah. if it's a success it can be career enhancing if it's a disaster it can be career limiting right so there's a lot of emotion and plus as you said just earlier you may have, to have involved there may have been all these different people involved and now you know, you need to make sure everybody got what they're looking for. So how, how do you go about at that point? How do you go about uncovering the uh, the fears, the uncertainties and the doubts? Well, I think, you know, as shocking as it might be, in many instances, we just ask, mm-hmm. you know, what's your biggest concern about this deal? What's your biggest concern about the product? Right. What do you think would be what your boss is most concerned about? Yeah, and and some people would find that um, I could I can tell that there's some there's some sellers would say Ooh, I don't know that I want to ask that question because you know what happens if I open a whole can of worms that derails the deal, but you would argue that you're better off opening the can of worms now than having it eat away at the relationship over time. Yeah, absolutely. Or having it sneak up on you where mm-hmm. all of a sudden you know they're you're not asking them what their concerns are. And they don't renew, they don't buy again, they don't subscribe, they don't, because we never addressed it mm-hmm. when we could have. 
you know, we could have addressed it. So, so what, yeah, I think just ask. So what, in your experience, when you've done this, what kind of reaction do you get from a, a buyer when you start asking about, you know, what are your biggest concerns? What are your worries about this, et cetera? Well, I think initially, you know, they're, they're a bit relieved, you know, because these buyers, they don't, they don't want to feel this way. They don't want to feel that kind of angst, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. So when you ask them and they go, yeah, I'll tell you what my concerns are. My concerns are that we'll not get this up and running in the month that you promised me we'd have it up mm-hmm. and running. Right. Oh, great. Now I know that that is your concern. I can build a plan and a strategy mm-hmm. and I can raise the profile of that concern within my organization. I mean, you, you know, I have a background in software as well. And that was one of the big things that we would hear. Um, so I think they're relieved to feel like I can give this burden to you and you're going to take care of it. I do want to do business with you. This is just my block. This is this thing I've got to get past. So this has to be a great trust builder, right? Because um, if if you are on the buyer side and the seller is, you know, asks these questions and actually listens and says, okay, let's figure out how we can mitigate. Um, that's got to be a huge trust builder, yeah? It is that, and it's an empathy generator. Mm-hmm. So it's a great opportunity for us to to kind of express our empathy and to and to stand in their shoes for a little bit and kind of get a grip on that. The other thing it does, if you do it well, and salespeople don't, as somebody who comes from a background in marketing and sales, don't do enough of returning this information back to marketing. Oh uh, yeah. So all this information that we're gathering with these questions should all be getting fed back into marketing and back into our content generation Mm -hmm. so that we can actually be preemptively doing some kind of content around that. Imagine that same exact question. Well, I'm concerned we won't be able to get this live in a month. Hey, do you know what? I can totally respect that. I know you've got some really tight timelines. Would it be helpful if I sent you a case study or two about some expedited implementations that we've done? Mm -hmm. Would that help? Yeah. And if they're like, well, yeah, it would. Great. And and in fact, yeah, I know because we did it ourselves and actually put together for that when people ask about implementation, we have a we have this lovely infographic where we say, here's the implementation process. And you're right, it's quite simple. I mean, there's a lot of these things are very simple, but they have a huge impact. Yeah, yeah. Most of the time, what they're coming up with with fear, uncertainty and doubt is that they don't understand the process. Mm hmm. So they're concerned that like, oh, I'm concerned that you're going to come back and ask me for more money in a month. Right. I'm concerned that I'm not going to have enough in the budget to cover off what you want and that there's going to be surprises. So they're concerned about that. They're concerned about capability. I'm not sure it's going to do what you said it's going to do. Mm -hmm. And then they're concerned about reliability. So I'm concerned that, you know, this is going to collapse or it's going to crash or you're not going to be there when I need you. So they're concerned about that relationship and that trust. Yeah. None of those are deal breakers. Mm-hmm. They're all opportunities to build the relationship stronger if I know exactly where those supports need to go. Yeah, no, I, I, I absolutely agree. And I think that um, and the other part I think is overlooked, as you say, is just post sale, because in that mm-hmm. in that early period post sale, um, when you as a buyer are, are implementing or whatever, you can that can be you can suddenly feel alone right you're on your own like oh my goodness did I make the right decision so you know whatever your process is being really supportive of that part is critical yeah and I think again checking in a lot um, you know salespeople have to overlap even if you have an account management team you know there's an opportunity to strengthen that relationship by bridging between you know, you know, the salesperson who's mm-hmm. the net new, as well as your salesperson who's doing account management or ongoing account um, delivery services, and having that bridge is really critical for the customer because they want, they need that extra support. I mean, they've stepped out off the ledge. Yeah, exactly. Right? The end of the deal. They are off the ledge, and they are now on this wooden bridge. <laughs> But that's happening between when I purchased and when I've actually become like a solid, re- you know, mm-hmm. customer that you can go to for references. That's a pretty shaky spot. We need to give them all the love and support we can during that time. Yeah. And they will really reward you in the long run if you help them during that period. I'm a firm believer. Um, listen, Julie, we're bumping up against the end of our time, but I wanted to give you a chance to tell our viewers a little bit more about yourself, how they can learn more about you and what you do. Absolutely. Well, thanks. I love talking about this stuff. And I think it's really useful for salespeople to think more strategically about how they work with their accounts. 
Um, I am a, a sales advisor and a professional speaker. I travel all over the world working with companies and at conferences, um, showing them tools and strategies that they can use to build better long-term, more profitable relationships with their customers. Basically, I help people sell a lot more to their very best customers. <laughs> Excellent. Well, listen, thanks, Julie. This has been a great conversation. Hope you'll come back and talk to us again soon. It'd be my pleasure. You take care, John. Yeah. My name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine, Pipeliner CRM. I'll see you all again soon. Bye. So I encourage you to subscribe to salespop.net, the online sales magazine. Also subscribe to our YouTube channel and then comment. Get involved in the conversation. Love to hear what you have to say.